Um, and my dad looked at me and was like, it's literally like a NFL team. Um, do it. Like, you'd be crazy not to. If you want to get into sports, like, you need to do it. And I was like, okay. So I did it. And my dad was right. It was the best experience that I could have ever had. Welcome back to another episode with me, your host, George, on today's episode. And here in front of me, we have Ellie Perigo, former events assistant of the Kansas City Chiefs, now with the KC current soccer team women's out, out in Kansas. Ellie, how are you? And thank you for joining the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm doing well. How are you doing? I'm excited. I'm really looking forward to having this chat. Um, I think I came across some of your stuff on LinkedIn and I was, I was kind of blown away about what it is you've been doing. Um, and I think a lot of my listeners and watchers will, will really enjoy this one. So we're going to get straight into it and talk about you. Um, obviously, some of your previous roles have revolved of all around, around sport in some way, shape or form. What is it that first got you interested in that kind of, that kind of pathway in terms of sport? Well, I really, I've been a part of a team my whole life. I grew up playing sports, um, played lacrosse for 13 years, and I'm not one that can sit still um, or do the same thing every day. I get kind of jittery, so I knew that I wanted to be involved in sports. Um, wasn't entirely sure what aspect or what realm of sports I wanted to be a part of, so it took a lot of trial and error for me. Um, started off trying to do broadcast journalism when I got to college, realized I did not want to be in front of a camera. Um, so just kind of took any opportunity that I could, uh, didn't matter if it was ESPN or a team, like an own team, um, our athletic department at the University of Miami. I just kind of took any opportunity I could find and it just led me here. Um, and I couldn't be more grateful for that. And you mentioned some of those things there, ESPN, Miami, we're going to touch on some of those because you've had quite a wicked career to date, I'd say. Um, but you mentioned something about Miami and it takes me back to when I was doing some research about you. What is this tradition at Miami Hurricanes and the fire extinguishers? Because I don't know, but I know something that I think it's a common thing that happens at the games. But tell me about that, because I'm really interested. So it started with it. I think it went back like forever. I don't know how really it started, but our spirit programming board, which is Category 5, awesome club at Miami, love what they're doing. They're kind of the inner, like in between liaison between the student body and the athletic department. Um, they love getting students involved. Um, and they just started like student section smoke is what it's called. And so at the, I want to say the end of the first quarter, um, or somewhere in there, they just, there's just our mascot, Sebastian will stand at the bottom of the student section. And, um, there's a specific song that plays and I'm blanking on what exactly the name is, which is so <laughs> bad of me. Um, but it just starts going and everybody does it. Um, it's awesome being able to use the fire extinguisher. Um, and I remember the first time I did it, I was like, oh, this is really cool. I don't know how they started this. I don't know how this got in here, but it's an awesome tradition. And I love being able to see it as an alum now, seeing him do it on TV. Like, it's such a cool experience. And I'm really glad and appreciative that I was able to be a part of that during my time there. Yeah, it looks like you got up to some really cool things. That's the one thing that I noticed when I speak to people stateside um, and with regards to college and high, even high school, college and, and everything after, the, the atmosphere, the unity, the bonds, the society, the communities, it, it, it's so much more powerful than it is over here. It seems like there's always something going on. There's always that, that kind of unity and spirit. And again, doing some research and looking, looking about some of the things that you've done, it's clear to kind of see that, um, which is something that I've always kind of envied being here in the UK. Cause although, yes, we you know soccer is a big thing for us, just like football and baseball and NBA is a big thing for you guys over there. But it's just never it's it's never celebrated in the same way and i always look and i look at the celebrations and i look at the way you guys celebrate sport in particular because sport brings people together but nothing like it does over there but on the on the theme of sport you were part of the kansas city chiefs training camp which is amazing so tell me about that how, how did that come about and what was it like so i started that not last summer but the summer prior um i was a training camp intern i applied through teamwork online um, which is a great resource for anyone trying to break into the sports industry. A lot of jobs are posted on that website. Um, and I just was applying to whatever I could. I, again, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, I had actually taken a internship with Belly Up Sports before I had known that I got the Kansas City training camp position or internship. Um, and when I got it, I was like, oh, I don't know if I should do it. It's a month. It's not paid. Like, I technically have to pay for the credits to do it because it's through Missouri Western. Yeah. Um, and my dad looked at me and was like, it's literally like a NFL team. Um, 
do it. Like, you'd be crazy not to. If you want to get into sports, like, you need to do it. And I was like, okay. So I did it, and my dad was right. It was the best experience that I could have ever had. Um, it then projected me into the role as the Arrowhead event seasonal for the following year, um, which kind of how that connects as well is my boss at the internship was the Arrowhead event seasonal. So then I became the manager and I oversaw all 30 interns the next summer. Wow. Um, and it was a really cool transition to go from being an intern to being the one overseeing the interns and being able to kind of guide them and help them um, as I, like I was there the summer before and kind of got to put my own twist on things, make improvements. And after being there, it just put me in a really good spot to like start being a leader. Um, yeah. And I really like it was a adjustment period for sure. Trying going from taking like to being told what to do to trying to tell people what to do. Um, so I really feel like I found my voice in that position and um, was able to kind of capitalize on leadership and now being able to help them as they try and transition into the working force after school. So it was a really awesome experience. You said something there that caught my attention about you weren't too sure what it is you actually wanted to do, but you did know it, you wanted it to be within the sports sector some way, shape or form. And I think it's really important because it's not always that we have the answers in terms of this is exactly what I want to do and I know how to get there. Whereas instead, we know the kind of remit or area that we want to be involved in, but we don't always have the steps to get there. It's, it's never really laid out. So your dad was right, in fact, um, taking yes. that role with the NFL. I mean, what a role and what an, what an opportunity. Like people over here would, would give an arm and a leg for that kind of role. Um, and it looked great too. I mean, I guess obviously you were on, on the field and sidelines doing different things, obviously being close, up close and personal with the players too. Is there any particular highlight of training camp? Um, I think for this year, really, it was probably just being able to plan it um, and help with that in the execution because for events, we were kind of on the fan facing side of things. But then I also got to go in and help with like our field visits that we would have for people that were executives or VIP, um, or they could do like our Chiefs Kingdom rewards program, they kind of got to do like a field visit. So going to then plan it, watch it go into execution, see it come to fruition, and then just being able to watch practice every day. Um, my first year at training camp, I was in kids zone, helping kids with like bouncy houses and doing lines. And so mm. actually getting to be involved and see practice and um, see what's going on with the team and then progress to then watching that team win a Super Bowl was like the just such a full circle experience for me. Um, and really just like, I love football. Um, yeah. That's kind of where my passion is. And so just being able to watch that was surreal um, and something that I will literally never forget. So yeah, yeah, that is full circle is a great way to describe that, you know, having you but you mentioned you were working with the kids and then being able to to, to celebrate the, with the team on the field when they won the Super Bowl. Um, I've seen all of that content and what kind of what amazing content it is, might I say. Um, your ESPN production coordinator role, is that something I believe you're still doing now? Or talk to me about that role. Um, because I'm really into ESPN, obviously another huge, big sports conglomerate who who are responsible for so many different things, the NFL too, and, and a number of different sports. What goes into that kind of role and how did that one come about too? Um, a lot goes into it and then how it kind of came about, I'll do this in two parts. But um, so at University of Miami, again, as I start said, I started in broadcast journalism um, and I did our, it was called UMTV Sports Desk, which was our student run sports program. And my freshman year, first semester, the executive producer at the time, um, her name is Amanda, she's awesome, but her she was a senior that year and her first job out of college was with ESPN as a production assistant. Um, and so after she graduated, I hadn't really talked to her much, um, but I must have left a good impression with her mm -hmm. because January of 2020, I got a text like New Year's Day and it was like, hey, do you wanna work the Super Bowl? And that's wow. all her text said and I was like, <laughs> I was like, what kind of question is that? Yeah, I want to work the Super Bowl. Um, and her mentor's wife was part of the NFL production team, um, and they just needed a runner. So that weekend of Super Bowl, um, LIV in Miami, which, mm -hmm. again, the, it was Chiefs 49ers, and I didn't really care who won that. I had no affiliation with either. Um, and I was, like, wrapping rocks with printer paper to make paperweights or going to get – breakfast or lunch for people or going to get like call sheets for the game, mm -hmm. um, driving uh, talent to the game. So 
just kind of doing a lot of the behind the scenes, like grit work. Um, and I loved it. Like at that time, that was the best weekend ever. Um, and then kind of transitioning over, I just kind of kept in contact with them, um, was a runner for a while. And then last May, I believe, mm -hmm. um, they, I became a part-time production coordinator. So now I kind of transitioned into the logistics piece of it and planning their travel, um, planning flights, planning their drivers, like just kind of coordinating the ins and outs. And um, the Super Bowl this year was the first time that I really got to step into that role entirely. Um, big learning experience, definitely challenging when mm -hmm. your team is in the Super Bowl and you kind of have to play that neutral party a little bit. Um, but I kind of just, that just kind of went, in, went into that one and it was awesome. It was the best like overlap I could have asked for. So mm -hmm. really special experience. It sounds like the proof is in the pudding in terms of doing these roles, starting at the bottom, so to speak, and then having to be able to progress and see that the results of your progress and then actually be involved at a deeper level. So you mentioned affiliations. Are you actually a Kansas fan or do you support a different team in the NFL? Um, I grew up a Carolina Panthers fan. Oh. Um, they like, I, I love the Panthers. Um, that's my <laughs> home team. That's like where my heart lies, but it was, I was never like a diehard fan of anything. Um, I just loved the sport. Right. So I consider myself a Chiefs fan now just because I got to like contribute and be a part of that team um, and actually see how things function, um, be a part of that functioning team. And then ultimately at the Super Bowl. So uh, yeah. I think my heart lies in Kansas City, but I'll forever love the Panthers as well. That is fair enough, to be fair. I mean, if I don't know anyone who's had that level of um, contact with a team in the NFL from working all different kinds of, of jobs with the team. So I think you can pretty much say you are a Kansas fan and you've picked yeah. a good team at that. I'm a Colts fan, so, you know, a bit of a rough season. Obviously, we've got the number four pick in the draft, so I'm a, I'm all eyes on the, the four quarterbacks that we're all talking about. And if you are, you know, you've got your heart. You, your mind is obviously there with the, with the Panthers. You guys have got the, the number one pick now, obviously, with the trade yes, with the Bears. Yes, trade so it up. Trade with the Bears. You did, indeed. On the note of, of, of the draft and everything like that, you've been to a, a couple of drafts now, I believe. But the, the one that I saw, again, going back to some of the research I did, I mean, those photos were... were were cold, ice cold, by the way, at the um, the draft in Indy. Obviously, an Indy fan, so I've always got my eye on the draft anyway. I know it's, it's held there every year. What is that like? Because I know a lot must go into that, surely. Um. So for, is this the combine then for? Uh, no, no, I think you were the draft. Yeah, well, both. Okay. You've done both? Yeah, so the Ooh. combine's in Indy, the draft changes every year. Yes, that's the one. The combine, yes. sorry, that's the one. What was that like? Let's talk about the combine first. Um, this was my first year at the Combine, which was awesome. Um, I got to do again, I helped with the Chiefs um, on their personnel side, and then I helped with um, ESPN as a production coordinator. But this position was a little bit different um, in terms of what it looks like. Usually I do the, the logistics piece um, and helping with the scheduling. But this time at the Combine, I got to help with the draft shoot. So what happens there is like all the prospects will come in, they have a time on their schedule and we, I got to help dress them and it's like, okay, what size do you wear? All right. Do you like this outfit? Do you like this outfit? And then they do like different rounds. They have like the big stage, they have a green screen, they have a photo, and then we have features, um, which some of the prospects do, not all of them. Um, but you just kind of like take them around and those are what is shown on TV when they get drafted. So right. they just came out with the first promo um, and it was really, really awesome to see like, oh, hey, I dressed them like they were all so nice. Um, and just being able to kind of be in there and see that then come to life. And so I'm excited for the draft this year and to see that kind of progression and see be like, hey, I actually worked on that and be able able to see it up front because usually it's just behind the scenes that no one really sees. Yeah. And if, that's one of the reasons why I really wanted to have this in this episode, because we all watch the draft, we all watch the combine, but no one ever sees the work that goes on behind the scenes. And without that and people like yourself, then none of this kind of happens, you know? Um, and we all love to see the shots and the content and whatever they're wearing and, and how they've styled it and all these 
uh, the short the shortcut clips. But again, no one ever sees how it how this happens behind the scenes. So yeah, I'm really glad that we've got you on and we're actually able to share how some of this works because I know it's something that I really wanted to hear. But moving slightly towards your your role um, as the events assistant at Arrowhead, what actually goes into that? So recently, I saw a I don't know what the name is, but you know the big the big screen you have at the Arrowhead Stadium when yes. you score and things like that. I, I I think I think it might have been on LinkedIn. Someone who someone who works in the Kansas team put actually put up a video of how they change that and whenever something happens to the lady who like all right put this one on there put that one on there so I think you know where I'm going with this what do you get involved in things like that and what do you get involved in and how does that work being an events assistant at a stadium like Arrowhead that by the way seats I think 71 or 72 thousand people yes um so I don't do that piece of it that is our production team they're amazing um but that kind of goes into the control room aspect. So anyone that does like production content, like that's kind of where they live out of. That's their home base for game day. Um, my position is a little bit different because as a special events seasonal for them, which was technically what my position was, I was in charge of tours and training camp and then other duties as a sign. So help yeah. with like concerts and things like that. But on game day, um, I was in charge of our game day tours. So checking people in and then, during pregame warmups, I would just be on the sideline with them, making sure that, you know, people were in the right spot, they're in the correct zone. Um, just kind of able to be there and being in that moment was really cool. Um, and then after that, I just, I got lucky that I was able to leave and watch the game or I could stay and watch the game. Um, I think I stayed for every single game, the whole game, except for the Seahawks game which it was negative 14 degrees outside wow. and I was like yep all right I'm gonna go watch this one at home um Oof. so negative yeah. 14 I mean it's crazy because again we watch these games obviously season starts in September we go all the way till February and we see how cold it is at some of these games whether it be in Buffalo or Green Bay or they might have to even move location because of that but I can never, I've never experienced that level of, of cold where I hear players talking about frostbite. You've got the big John Bro heaters on the sideline. Um, so that's, that is really interesting. But you mentioned at the start of the show that, you know, you, you can't stay still for too long. A couple of things. There's a clip I've seen on your social media of you running um, and it looks like you're running to or, to or from a job, which is number one. But that leads me to ask you this. In your role as your events assistant um, at Arrowhead, is there any time where things go wrong and you have to think fast on your feet and make changes or decisions, you know, in the heat of the moment? Oh, absolutely. Um, nothing ever is going to go perfect. And it's kind of you're prepared for something to go wrong. And it's just how you respond to that. Um, a big thing I learned is to like not be frantic, figure it out. Like there's a solution to everything. Um, so you really have to be solution oriented. You have to think clearly, not let it bother you and be like, OK, like this went wrong. How do I fix it? Um, and just like immediately go into that. So trying to think of an example of that, but like training camp, for example, that was like, oh, there were a lot of things that would come up and um, trying to figure out like, okay, I haven't done this role before. It looks a little bit different this year, kind of get, uh, working out the kinks a little bit, but something's always bound to go wrong. Um, so it's just kind of how you attack it, what your like end goal is there and figuring out what the solution is that works best. And Maybe at that time, it's the best solution. But then after you can kind of look back and be like, okay, um, how do I then make it better for next time and kind of make sure that doesn't happen again? Or what's a better solution that we can come up with? Yeah, yeah. Um, I recently spoke with Laura Oakman, um, NFL sideline reporter for Westwood One and Fox Sports. You probably already know who, who she is. And she's obviously the, the third, third longest tenured sideline reporter in NFL history, which is amazing. But one thing that she said that really stood out to me, she's really big on female empowerment, um, women in sports, getting women to understand that they can do things that people say they can't do. You've achieved a great amount of things and it speaks volumes to your work. I think your dedication, your grit, you mentioned that earlier. But have you had any challenges into getting into any of these roles that you've you've worked hard to, to achieve and find yourself in? Or has it not been that the case for you? Um, I think yes and no for that. I'm very determined. And like if I have my eyes set on something, I don't really take no for an answer. Um, no for me is not right now. Um, so nothing has really kind of stopped me from that. Um, I think the biggest challenge I have is especially trying to move from events to then going either to the sports side, the team side. Um, it's kind of the perception that I get from people that also work in that space. Um, mm -hmm. And just like 
kind of keeping my head down and not letting the talk around it get to my head um, and realizing that what I'm doing like isn't wrong, isn't a bad thing, um, but it's a very different side of the business and yeah. one that is like really hard to break into. Um, and so just kind of keeping the noise out, keeping like focused um, and leaning on those around me that are in that position. Um, other females that work for a team um, are on the team side and kind of using them as a guide and mentors. And I have so many across the league and the NFL and now coming into the w, um, NWSL, like just kind of leaning on those other females and leaning on those that uh, came before me and now helping those that come behind me to make sure that we can keep this path going and uh, bring up the rest of the trailblazers that I know are going to come from um, Ex that are working exactly their way. That. Exactly that. You use the word there that I really like, trailblazers, and that's exactly what you, you are doing. Um, you mentioned, obviously, you have other female counterparts who you lean on. Erin Roberge, who I'm hopefully going to have on the show too, who recently became the first full-time athletic trainer for the Packers. Um, if another lady who is just like yourself is, is trailblazing and, and, you know, showing people that it can be done and to, like you say, block out the noise. So I ask because it's important that we shine the light and celebrate what women are doing in sports because, that you know, there is, like you said, so much noise around it. And when you're trying to break into certain industries, it can be difficult at times. Um, and talking of difficulties, did COVID affect you in any of your roles? Um, it Yes and no, I guess I have a lot of those. Um, it did in terms of I, if I wanted to work in football at the University of Miami, I didn't really get that chance to because my junior year, um, everything was closed. They didn't have any students working in the athletic department. Um, and so I was just kind of like in an in-between where I wanted to do either marketing or football or whatever, and I couldn't really do it until my senior year. So I kind of just went on the events path because – that was going to help me kind of break into the NFL based on the training camp internship that I had. Yeah. Um, so I, I mean, I probably would have looked a little bit different if COVID hadn't happened. Um, I would have tried to go into the team side of things earlier, um, but it just kind of put another thing on my resume and helped me kind of grow on a different element um, to then eventually get there. So more like a hiccup, but I don't, I think it was, I used it to my advantage rather than kind of dwelling on it. Oh, no, absolutely. I think that's clear to see without a doubt. You've used it as a springboard to the next opportunity. Um, events, it's your bag at the minute, especially at the level like the NFL or even a Casey current soccer team that you're talking about where you are currently. It's all about putting on a show. We spoke about the, the fire extinguishers at the, the Canes, which is obviously something for the, for the fans, for the crowd. It, it looks good. You know, if you're in the stadium, it probably feels good too. Whilst you were at KC looking after events and the events assistant. Is there anything that stood out to you that they did differently? Perhaps maybe use of technology for fans and things like that, or um, new trends that they would get going around the crowd, or in terms of in terms of your role as events, is there anything different that you would say Casey did that really stood out for you or that you really enjoyed in, in terms of your job? Um, hmm. I think for like the events um, at the Chiefs, at least, um, my role at the current looks a little different, but mm -hmm. for the Chiefs, at least, they had like this uh, program that any fan could kind of use. Um, if there was an issue, there was a number that they could text. And we had a whole team that stood in like it was like the war room, um, I believe is what uh. they called it. But like anything that happened at the stadium, whether it was like someone was sick or someone needed like medical help or something like, I don't know, not that a fire ever happened, but like if a fire happened or just people there that were responding to these, um, the fan experience team at the Chiefs, they go well unnoticed and have the hardest job in that building by far. Um, they're kind of the ones front line for fans um, putting out fires and so much respect to all the girls that are in that those roles over there. Um, but that was a really cool thing that I don't think I would have ever thought of and making sure that they really did put fans first. Um, and so that was something that I thought was really cool and really like a fan they knew that they had support um so yeah, that was yeah. a good okay. piece for them so you're currently at kc current the women's soccer team in kansas looking back on your experiences where you've worked be it esba in kansas city's training camp events assistant um i think that was it belly up the name of the other the other the company that you worked for too yeah what have you taken from those previous experiences that you can you feel you can utilize or adapt with and and even grow whilst you're in your new role with Casey Current? Um, a lot of my role here too is as a player care coordinator. Um, I give a lot of the credit from 
work that I did that wasn't my actual job. Mm -hmm. um, so when I was at the Chiefs, I my primary job was in events, but I also helped our player engagement um, department as well as our player personnel department. And just kind of helping where I could, I knew that was the side I wanted to be on. Um, and so just volunteering my time, being able to help onboard players or help them look for apartments or drive players to, I don't know, dinner or to drive them for, to and from a hotel, like just kind of being there to support them, um, learning how to interact with players, learning like what it, they're like mentally um, in terms of, okay, how can I help them off the field that can help them perform on the field? Uh, working with their families. So I learned a lot of that from my volunteer time um, at the Chiefs. Mm -hmm. And Ramsey, who is the director of player engagement at the Chiefs, is the best mentor that I could have asked for. He's helped me so much um, in terms of shaping me in this role. And as I'm starting this department for Casey Curran and the first one to be in this role, wow. um, just kind of like making sure that I have a plan. Um, I have a structure and making sure that my focus group here is the players. Um, players are first, giving them a voice in the front office and making sure that decisions are made with their voice being heard um, and not decisions being made without them having any input. So just kind of being their voice, being there for them, there for their families and just kind of being that point of contact for whatever they need. Um, so that's kind of what shaped me here. And mm -hmm. it was the best step for me um, in terms of growth. And so I'm really excited to kind of get started here and kind of make that impact and see how I can help this team and organization grow. Really well said, really well said. But I'm curious, those those car journeys where you're driving talent around, what's the vibe like? Are we going karaoke? Is it silent? Like what, what are the kind of discussions that you have in the car? I mean, I'm thinking of, I'm thinking a bit of James Corden, carpool karaoke, but I'm not too sure if that's a vibe. <laughs> um, I wish it was. I kind of go about the, like my kind of, staple there is I don't really talk unless I'm spoken to. Um, I don't really want to overstep or yep. kind of invade, um, especially when it's a vulnerable time. They don't know me. Um, they It's kind of hard to trust like automatically. So I would ask like, hey, how are you doing? Like, how was your flight? Whatever. And just kind of go from there. And if they speak to me, great. Um, then I kind of keep the conversation going that way. But I don't ever want to overstep or make them feel uncomfortable. And just kind of like, I'm not there to be their friend. I'm there to get them from point A to point B. Um, and so, and that was for the, those roles. Now it's more trying to gain the trust of these athletes being around as much as possible, um, making sure that they know they can trust me. They know that I'm reliable. They know that I have their back. Um, so just building those relationships and making a really strong foundation. Um, yeah. Nice. Okay. Last but not least, to the young ladies who you know may want to follow in your footsteps or the young ladies that aren't aware to you are already following in what you're doing and they're tracking what you're doing and they're looking up to you as someone uh as an icon a trailblazer like you mentioned what words of advice would you give to the younger generation in terms of going after what it is you want to do definitely never give up um never let anyone tell you you can't do something because you absolutely can whatever you want to do you can do um when you say yes and when you are driven to do something, the sky is a the limit. There is no ceiling for you. Um, there's only opportunity. So just kind of run with it. Go follow your heart, follow your dream. If it's hard, awesome. It's going to make you better. Um, and even if that path hasn't been paved before you, pave it yourself. Like you can do it and you will make a big statement and a big impact on whatever you want to do if that's where your heart is. So let, don't let anyone ever tell you no, because yes, you can. And if you ever need help, um, there are so many women in this industry. There are men in this industry as well that are there to support you, have your back and are there to be with you and push you forward. So definitely keep going. And with that, that brings us to the end of the show. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Ellie. Um, again, I'm, I'm really happy you agreed to do this because, again, we see so much of the finished product with, with the sporting world itself, but we never see or we'll get to hear about how things go behind the scenes. And whether people like it or not, you guys play a key, key role in, in, in everything. So thank you for coming on. Um, keep being an example to the younger generation. I think that's a really big thing because, you know, we talk about it right now, blocking out the noise and just going after what it is you want. And you are a shining light and evidence of that. So keep doing what you're doing. Um, I wish you all the best at the KC Currents. And once again, thank you for coming on the show. 
I've been George from George on Sports, here with Ellie Perigo, formerly events assistant at the Kansas City Chiefs, now player care coordinator at the KC Current, and we'll see you on the next episode.